it's good to see all of you again down the hill on this end of the thing. Who are you? <laughs> My name is Tamara Jackson Zims, and I'm still the extension corn pathologist at the University of Nebraska, where I cover not only diseases caused by nematodes in corn, but also a lot of other things in this session we're gonna talk about caused by fungi and bacteria. And we use a lot of foliar fungicides. I'm gonna share some results from some of our trials there. I'm joined at this stop by Bob Fanning. Why don't you talk about what you do, Bob? Uh, I'm the plant pathology field specialist based in Winter, South Dakota. And my counterpart is Connie Strunk, who Tamara mentioned. Uh, Tamara is based in Sioux Falls at the regional center there. And just kind of partly by virtue of location, I probably specialize a whole lot more in wheat than I do corn and soybeans. But and Connie consequently does a lot more with corn and soybeans, but we have to overlap a little too. So especially when family members show up. So anyway, I'll be with you after camera gets. All right, fantastic. Well, welcome to your last, I guess, tent session of the day. And so let's start off by saying in Nebraska, we're using a lot more foliar fungicides in the last three, four or five years than what we've used historically. And so one of our messages there is to talk about the importance of criti critically importance of diagnostics and making sure that people understand how to differentiate between diseases and knowing what symptoms to look for because a lot of the diseases we're having are caused by bacteria and other problems that you can't manage with a foliar fungicide. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about a few of those as well. And so let me share this slide with you first. And so on this slide, have I got this turned right for everyone to see well? On this slide, we've got two basic categories here of a partial list of pathogens on the left here that can be managed with foliar fungicides, and then a list of bacterial diseases that we're seeing in corn that you cannot manage with foliar fungicides. What we're gonna have in this session are some disease plant samples that you're gonna get to see firsthand what some of these symptoms look like to try to familiarize you with what some of these look like in case you haven't seen them for a while or ever. During a droughty year like what we're having right now, many of the diseases that require moisture are really not cranking up like we've seen them in the past. And, and that's really good news for all of us. But I wanna take the opportunity to show you some of these to keep you familiar with a lot of them. And so one of the most important diseases, especially fungal foliar diseases, is called gray leaf spot. And you guys have some of that in South Dakota too. And so you, you know what I'm talking about. Probably didn't have too much yet this year, I'm guessing, Matt. Okay, well, I'm gonna show you some samples that have gray leaf spot. A couple things that I want you to look, that's not it. A couple things that I'm gonna want you to look at when these samples come around. And keep in mind is that this is caused by a fungus. In particular, this and other fungi that I'm gonna talk to you about are gonna require some pretty specific weather conditions. Mainly that weather is intended for spore germination and infection of the plant to cause symptoms. When these come around, the symptoms you're looking at are those rectangular gray lesions. And there's quite a bit on these leaves I'm gonna send around. And you're gonna notice by the size of these leaves that these are lower from the plant. Well, that makes sense. This is a residue-borne disease. Thank you, Tim, if you could look at it and share it. Yep. If it's circular, oval, or lens, it's fungus, right? Isn't that kind of the rule of thumb? Circular, oval, or? Or a lens shape. Yeah, that's part of what I go through. Yeah, that's, that's probably accurate. Okay. Now, we have some examples, though, that are similar to the shapes you mentioned <laughs> and caused by bacteria. Yeah. And so that's Holka spot here, but you know, to me, this looks also a lot like really light gramoxone damage too, a little spritzing. And also, we've also got some surfactant damage uh, mixed a little bit too hot. We can get some symptoms that look a lot like that too. Looking at distribution, both in the field as a whole, on the plant itself, and on the individual leaf is really gonna be what's gonna give you the biggest clue as to whether you're talking about something that's a chemical injury or some pathogen. 
And so think about symptom distribution on those three scales, the field, individual plants, and on the individual plant parts. That's going to be really helpful to you in trying to identify the problem. What you're looking at right now going around the tent is gray leaf spot that tends to start on the lower leaves. Now we measure and try to identify and estimate gray leaf spot severity in a couple of different ways, both looking at the surface area of the leaf that's been compromised, but also looking at how high on the plant those lesions are developing. You're probably aware that the ear leaf and everything above that contributes about 80% to your overall yield and making those leaves of the plant the most important for yield contributions. And that's why it's extra important to try to stop or slow down things like gray leaf spot that are moving up the plant. And so we start getting bent out of shape about gray leaf spot when it's about one or two leaves, thank you, on or below the ear leaf. The reason is also because gray leaf spot in particular, after infection takes place, might take 14 to 21 days to develop into a lesion that you will recognize. And so when you see gray leaf spot lesions moving up the plant, and especially when they get near the ear leaf, keep in mind that the leaf one or two above that are also infected probably, and that you may still have lesion development on those. Keep that in mind when making a fungicide decision too, because it does take several extra days for gray leaf spot development. Other diseases are very different though, and so we'll talk about those in a minute. Let's skip down a little bit to these bottom two, eye spot and anthracnose. Now talking about weather requirements and temperature requirements, these are two contrasting ones. Eye spot in particular is a fungus that likes cool, wet conditions. Well, obviously 2012 has not been an eye spot year because we've got a lot of heat and a lot of drought. Well, eye spot is another example of a residue borne disease. It does start on the bottom leaves and works its way up. We don't usually need a fungicide to manage that one because once things get hot like it's been recently, it's going to stop this one. But you are more likely to see more of this one than we are. Being you're a little further north, you probably have cooler, more extended spring periods. Pretty much every, every corn on corn field irrigated, you, bet. you see it every year. Exactly. Does it's, it cause that much loss as far as yield? No, not, not usually. If you have extended periods of cool, wet weather throughout the summer, like we did in 2011 maybe, that would be a time when you might need to consider a fungicide application, but not normally. Just like you said, now you also mentioned something else. You mentioned continuous corn and right. you also mentioned irrigation. Yeah. That's a high risk environment all the way around. Right. And so some two things to keep in mind. Those are also high risk environments for most of the diseases we're gonna talk about, especially the ones that are residue borne, like gray leaf spot and anthracnose. Anthracnose is one that likes warmer temperatures, hot even. <clears throat> but it also needs the moisture and the high humidity. We typically don't see as much of the leaf blight phase of that disease. We typically see that same fungus causing more stalk rots and top diebacks where you see the top three or four nodes completely die and turn brown. At least in the western corn belt, that's what we see. In the eastern corn belt, that's where they see more of this leaf blight phase. Make no mistake though, all of these pathogens are opportunistic and knowing which conditions they need will help you anticipate which ones you might see in the coming season. And that one in particular, like I said, needs a lot of warmth and moisture. So watch out for that one. Excellent. Let's jump back up here to the two rust diseases. In contrast to everything we've talked about so far in this tent, the other pathogens, like we mentioned, are residue born. And so they're gonna, they're gonna survive and overwinter well and infected crop residue from previous season or seasons. And so you can, you can really realistically anticipate, you'll see them again in the next year or years coming back to corn. The rust diseases are different though. And you need to keep in mind, rust do not overwinter here, neither 
ones of corn or soybean or your wheat fields that you guys are looking at more frequently. Rust spores have to blow in from your southern states. And so having continuous corn or residue or a history of those rust diseases has no bearing on whether or not you're going to see it again. So that's the good news about rust diseases. The bad news is, is that there is a lot more corn production in the southern states, also in northwest Mexico. And these spores can travel and do travel hundreds of miles. Now we lose a few of them to mortality and UV radiation, but the sheer numbers that they're producing, hundreds and millions and millions of spores, is why we continue to see more and more rust coming up from the south and southwest of us. The two rust diseases we're talking about are common rust and southern rust. Very different beasts here. And so the first one I want to show you is common rust. Now common rust is a disease we don't get very concerned about during most years. Common rust is a pathogen that likes a little bit cooler temperatures, optimum temperatures in the 70s. I see a lot of it in Wisconsin when I go over there. Yes. Exactly. Common rust is a much bigger deal north and east of us where they have cooler springs and summers. Common rust can be a problem, especially in sweet corn and things like that. But typically, in our environment, it hasn't been a consistent problem. It can be a problem, though. And so rust diseases in general can be major yield robbers. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I'm going to pass around some leaves with common rust and you'll notice there's not much on here. If you brought up some from Wisconsin or maybe Michigan, you would see a lot more on here. But when you get this, make sure you look on both the upper and the lower surface and you can see that epidermis bubbling up and spores pushing through. Get your hand on there and wipe off. Most of our spores have been wiped off today. But you'll find that they're kind of a brick red to brown color. That's one characteristic you can use to tell them apart from the other rust spores, southern rust. And so take a good look at those. Common rust is going to produce spores equally, equally well on both the upper and the lower leaf surface. We don't get too bent out of shape about it. It's southern rust that we really do get concerned about when it moves into the state and especially when it comes in mid-season, earlier than that latter part of the season. It comes in all the time right at the end of the season, but the corn's pretty much made by then. This year, as well as in 2006 and 2007 in particular, southern rust came in very early. We also had a lot of moisture. Rust pathogens need that humidity and dew for those spores to germinate and infect the plant. We create some of those environments in our irrigated fields, like what we've got in Nebraska. And in fact, right now in northeast Nebraska, just south of you, in Madison County and Cumming County, Nebraska, we have a problem with southern rust in some of our irrigated fields, and people are walking out of them orange. Well, by the time you walk out orange, it's too late to do anything about it. So it's important for all of you to know that you have the inoculum flying into your state right now. Let me show you what southern rust looks like so that you can be on the lookout for it. I think this is the best example. Now notice, we've laminated this one in plastic. I don't want you to blame me for spreading southern rust around. You're getting it from us anyway from Nebraska. I want you to see it up close though. So I'm going to pass this example around and the hey, all Nebraska, it's always Nebraska's fault, isn't it? You're going to think that here in a minute. We're going to talk about Goss's wilt, and then you'll know it's our fault. <laughs> so when this comes around, if uh, I don't think that's on, you'll have to push that button. I also recommend when you're looking at this sample, hold it up to the light too, and notice how when it's backlit, you can see halos around some of those pustules. Not all hybrids do that but more so than not, I think that's a pretty good characteristic to help you recognize southern rust. Also notice on the upper leaf surface, you see active sporulation, orange to tan spores. Not so much on the bottom of the leaf blade. Now sometimes we get sporulation on the midrib on the bottom side, or even on the leaf sheath as it wraps around the stalk. And that's a characteristic of southern rust. This is a very aggressive pathogen. 
It only takes a few days, as little as four days, from infection to pustule development and more spore production when it's got the right environment. And for southern rust, the right environment is in the lower to mid 80s. We tend to see the most southern rust when we've had temperatures in the hundreds, not because of the daytime highs though, it's because of our nighttime temperatures. So keep the nighttime lows in mind and when we have those sticky, muggy nights, that is perfect southern rust environment, okay? Just some things for you to watch for and you've got a lot of pictures in your hand out there and a lot more slides to look at. The good news about rust are they can be managed with the very same fungicides that you're managing gray leaf spot with. And some of our more common systemic fungicides, the ones going on right now, have multiple modes of action from both classes. I say both because that's what we're restricted to at the moment in our commercial fungicides for row crops. We've got lots of fungicide categories to choose from, but right now these products are from the triazoles and the strobilurins. And so Headline Amp, Quilt Excel and Stratego Yield, three of our top products, have active ingredients from both of those classes. And so that'll help us minimize the risk for resistance development. And it also provides you some preventive activity for stopping future infections and a little curative activity too for infections that have just taken place. It doesn't stop ones that are already sporulating. And you also need to know fungicides are usually going to last you about 14 to 21 days. And so it's a narrow window of protection that you have. And so getting it on at the right time is exceptionally important. Not waiting until you're orange coming out of the field, but getting it on right as you see infection starting to develop. Okay, and that can be in a matter of a few days. If we have southern rust in the area, I wish people would scout twice a week instead of once a week like they typically do. Excellent, any questions about southern rust to this point? Okay, at the moment we don't have resistance available in our commercially available hybrids. Resistance to southern rust is in more of our tropical inbreds that we're not really using in our commercial hybrids. So it must be in common rust as far as resistance because I see Yes, that. common rust is very different. Yeah. So we do have resistance to common rust, just not southern rust yeah. as much. And that's another reason we don't worry about it as much. We've got some natural built-in yeah. resistance, even if it's maybe accidental and not so well known. Good, very good. All right, let's move on a little bit and let's talk about some of these others on this side of the page. Goss's bacterial wilt and blight is by far the one that keeps me awake wondering what we're gonna do next. You've got that disease in South Dakota right now and you've had it for a couple of years. Well, it's caused by a bacterium. That's not news to any of you. The bacterium that causes it is a little bit different from any of the other ones that we're fighting. It is gram positive. Now that doesn't have any practical implications for most of you in the field. What it tells us pathologists is that it has some different characteristics in the cell wall. We don't know what that implication is, but it's probably not a coincidence. And so that's just one characteristic we're considering. Okay, Bob, why don't we switch? Is that? Yes. The Clapperbacter of Michigan. Exactly. The one that we have now, is that the same strain as the 1969 strain? Ooh, that's a good question, and that's going to have a long answer. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Everybody's excited. I can tell. <laughs> good job, Matt. Okay. Actually, it's a good lead in, and I think it is something we all need to consider. Back in the 1970s, using the technology, DNA based technology that they had, they compared what we call isolates. It's like individuals of you, and compared the genetics of them side by side using the technology they had available at that time period, they couldn't tell them apart. They essentially all looked the same, homogeneous populations. More recently, and in fact published just last year in 2011, taking some of those same isolates, the individuals from the 60s and 70s, and comparing them with contemporary newer isolates collected in the 2000s, they found differences this time. The problem is with the type of testing they were using, both AFLP and box PCR, they can't tell what those differences mean as far as what we would call phenotype, whether that means they're a new, more virulent strain, 
or it could be something as simple and uh, unimportant as color and culture. Simple differences. We don't know that, but they are different. And to me, what's even more important about that research that was published is that the results said that the bacteria collected more recently since 2000, and actually all of them but one were collected since 2005, which would really be in line with this more recent epidemic we're seeing. Those are the bacteria that were separated out into their own special group, implying something has changed more recently. And that might be our first step in explaining why the disease has reemerged since around 05 and 06 and really started to change and develop more frequently. Excellent question. I just thought maybe because we have more, I mean, as far as the aggressiveness of it, yeah. the nature of this one, I just thought, I mean, I assumed it was a different strain, but I thought the reason why it was more aggressive is because more corn. And that could be too. There's half a dozen different things that we do now that probably yeah. favor Goss as well, whether it's reduction in tillage, which supports more infected residue on the surface. It could be the corn on corn. It could be that, you know, it's not practical for our seed companies to continue to screen for a disease that hasn't been around for 20 years, because that's about how long it was gone. And so they put their efforts into diseases that are more common current problems. And it's possible some more susceptible plants or lines came back into our lineup. There's a lot of different reasons, but that paper that was published is our first step in saying that there may be strains, but we can't say it for certain with that data. Let's look at some Goss's wilt though, and you better hang on to this one tight, okay? <laughs> and I'm not gonna repeat that for the camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This smells a little bit like silage now. They've been riding around with me since Monday. So keep me, keep bear this in mind. There are two different types of disease that that bacterium, Clavibacter michiganensis, nebraskaensis, can cause. It can cause a more common foliar blight or leaf blight phase. And that's what all of you have seen if you've seen it in South Dakota. That's I've seen it systemic though. Yes, and that's I've the second it. thing we'll talk yeah. about. I don't have any of that with me. The foliar blight phase is kind of how things start. And so, oh no. And so we're gonna pass this around. <laughs> we all get a little punchy toward the end of the day here. When this comes around, there's two things I want you to look for. The presence of dark green or black freckles. Now, scientifically, those are known as discontinuous water-soaked spots. I prefer freckles, though, for general conversation. But where I want you to look for those are on the ends or edges of lesions. Don't pay attention to all this black gunk in the middle of a lesion. Those are other fungi that have moved in and colonized that dead tissue and started to sporulate. Look right up there where the giant thumb is and see on the edges of those lesions where you see these, these freckles, right? Let me get out of the way. You see some right here and here and all along here on the edge of the lesion. This is the only pathogen that we know of that can cause this type of symptom. And so this is a really diagnostic characteristic. Most of our hybrids show that really well. And so we've got two or three samples here alone, actually three really good ones. I'm gonna pass these to Tim. And if you could, please look at those and share them with your neighbors. Oh, here's another one, that one's good too. I'm sorry, let's just keep loading you up. Okay, okay. and so the second thing when those leaves come around that I want you to look for is that the bacteria themselves will actually be pushed out onto the surface of the leaf and pool on there in little spots. And so right here where you see what may look like white spots on this picture, that's actually little sparkly shiny spots. Once those bacteria dry on the surface, they kind of give it a glittery appearance. They can also be washed off by rain or irrigation. So sometimes if you're out in the field, you're gonna need to turn those leaves upside down and look on the bottom surface. That shiny exudate, or more commonly known as bacterial ooze, are one of two things. The freckles and the ooze, what you need to look for when trying to diagnose the leaf blight phase, okay? And as far as the leaf blight phase goes, the leaf blight phase, while it can cause substantial yield loss, this is not the most devastating 
disease that or disease phase that we can get. It's actually much more severe when you start getting the systemic wilt. These are all about V6, V7 plants. Well, the plants, when they're at approximately V4 to V6, they are especially vulnerable to this systemic wilt. Part of the reason is believed to be that the growing point of these plants is right there at the ground level and all of the nodes are stacked very closely, tightly together. Any one of them that becomes infected is much more likely to spread to all the other nodes then. And so plants that do become systemically infected, if you cut a cross section of them, like in the upper left hand corner, you're going to notice a lot of discoloration of those vascular bundles, orange or brown. And that's the indication that the bacteria are moving throughout the plant. And unfortunately, that those plants are not likely to survive that infection. These guys will be dead in a matter of days before they have a chance to put on an ear or a tassel. And they may or may not have that foliar blight symptom on them, the freckles and the ooze that you just saw. And so this isn't particularly diagnostic. Other bacterial wilts like uh, bacterial stalk rot caused by Erwinia may look like this too, that total overall meltdown of the plant. When this develops, this is when we see the worst yield loss because these plants may die in large patches in the field like in the panhandle of Nebraska. And then you have secondary weed problems coming in after that. So, we are just now beginning to see the systemic wilt phase in eastern Nebraska and over into Iowa, and maybe now in South Dakota too. Last year around here on, I mean, the Gosses was present, and every once in a while there'd be a plant you split it apart and be that. Okay. You know. That's bad news, you know, because you're going to probably get into that situation where yeah. annually you start to see more and more. Here's some more bad news about the systemic wilt. We have great resistance, or some might say tolerance, to the leaf blight phase, like what you're looking at right now. Unfortunately, even our best resistant hybrids have no impact on the systemic wilt phase. And so we don't even understand how the resistance works well enough to understand why it's not effective against systemic wilt, but our companies are reporting back they're seeing the same thing. Even more complicated is that we're not able to duplicate that systemic wilt. All the leaves you're looking at today came from an artificially inoculated field. It's easy to work with this bacteria. All you need is a weed eater and a backpack of water and bacteria to get the disease. Because it is easy to work with. These bacteria take advantage of wounding. And so whether that's caused by hail or high winds or uh, sandblasting, there's, there's adequate wounding there to allow those bacteria to get into the plant. We know that when those plants are wounded very young, there's a lot higher chance they'll become systemically infected. Okay, Bob, let's see what we got here. Okay, so that's the first in my list of bacterial diseases. We've got a few others too that we see that we aren't nearly as concerned about or don't even really have anything to do about. We'll come back to Goss's wilt in a minute, but we see Holka's spot and we talked about it a little bit earlier. It can look like a chemical burn, a surfactant injury. Uh, that particular one has a wide host range and it might be confused with other diseases like gray leaf spot or even eye spot. Not usually a problem to be worried about though. Hot temperatures tend to slow it down too and make it go away. Chocolate spot is pretty much the same. Hot temperatures slow that down. Not a widespread problem at this time, but something we're seeing out west. And there's the bacterial stalk rot. And so the way to differentiate this stalk rot with Goss's wilt is simply with your nose. This is the one that has that putrid odor. And it's not that Goss's wilt smells good by any means. It is bacterial after all. But this one is the one that has the horrible odor. And so in this case, the top just pulled out of the plant. And if you take a whiff of it, it's going to tell you right away that that's not Goss's wilt. It is possible, though, to have co-infections with both in the same plant. So that can make diagnostics a little bit complicated. All right, Bob, let's see what else we got. 
like you, we are also desperate to try to find rescue treatments to help us slow down or even stop Goss's wilt from spreading. We do have some bacteria, bactericides that are labeled for corn, more commonly used in other crops like dry bean and sugar beet. But one of those products is called Cocide 3000. The active ingredient is a copper hydroxide. And so in 2009, we tested this in some of our artificially inoculated plots in Gothenburg, Nebraska at the Monsanto Water Utilization Center. We have a lot of negative controls here. These are yield data, and you have the complete data set in your packet to look at later. This is just yield from the susceptible hybrid. On the left-hand side, you've got treatments that were not injured versus all these in yellow that were injured. In blue, on the left half of the graph, this is where we did not inoculate. And the reason we have a lot of negative controls here is because we had a natural level of infection in that location, which is the only reason we could do research on it there and why we didn't move our trials further east at that point like we have now. I really want to focus your attention, though, on the right-hand side of this graph. And over here on the right-hand side are treatments, either no or a non-treated control or treatments made immediately before inoculation, that's within 48 hours before, or immediately after inoculation. That was actually about 24 hours later. To our surprise, it was actually the coside treatment made immediately after inoculation that gave us the best benefits. In, for disease control, that's the only one, was this one that reduced disease significantly. Not surprisingly, it was the yield of that particular treatment that was highest, although not always statistically different from some of the other products. It was more than the headline fungicide, but that is a fungicide, not a bactericide. And so in this instance, we weren't able to show any plant health benefits that also helped against the bacteria. This is one year worth of data versus at one location. This is all we've got at this point, but this year we have an extensive trial with about 17 different products at our location at our Agricultural Research and Development Center. So this winter we'll have more data to share with you. And this complete data set was published in the UNL Crop Watch newsletter on June 9th. And I would encourage you all to, to uh, sign up for that one and subscribe. It is a free newsletter and we put all of our disease and other pest management updates in there as well. So it's a valuable resource for a lot of people and would have some application to you. All right. There are a few other diseases that we have been seeing this and in recent years that get people confused and been out of shape. And so for instance, Purple leaf sheath is one of those, and we don't worry about this. It is a cosmetic problem. But what you see is a dark lesion that starts just below the collar. Yes, exactly. And so this is after pollination normally, and after those anthers have fallen off the, the tassels and been captured at the base of that leaf going down below the collar, pathogens and saprophytes move in and start to colonize it and it gives you a lesion and that's as big as most of them usually get. Sometimes though it can get really ugly and you can have those lesions wrap all the way around that sheath. Ironically though we know it's not getting into the vascular system because it's not killing the rest of the leaf. It's just a cosmetic issue. Plus it does not ever get to go into the stalk. We don't worry about that one. Another one, though, that we do see quite a bit of, also caused by a fungus, is called Physoderma brown spot. This particular fungus needs wet conditions. It's a chytridiomycete. It produces swimming spores that need water to move around in and infect. The reason people get bent out of shape about it, and I'm going to pass it around and show it to you, is because on the leaf blade, it has kind of an orangish brown appearance. It scares people because it looks, at a glance, a lot like southern rust. The way you're going to tell it apart from other diseases, and especially southern rust, is because you usually see it in banding patterns across the leaf, because infection takes place in the whorl. You've seen down in the whorl, it's filled with water and then it's empty and filled with water. 
and you have that alternating cycle of wet and dry. Well, the leaf is emerging up through there at the same time, and when it's wet, you have infection take place in that band. That's what causes the banding pattern. And while this disease can be controlled with a fungicide, we don't normally recommend that. It's not something that should be a common problem and usually not widespread enough for us to have to worry about that. Is there one? Is it down here? There. Thank you. We have a whole mess of leaves here. And you're the last group, so you get to look at all the rest of them if you want. Okay, here, oh, here's a good one. And so, Physoderma brown spot. And so here, the banding pattern is obvious on this leaf. And so you've got a band up here and then a big band down here. Now, it's infected all the way across the leaf but the appearance is different whether it's on the blade or inside the midrib. In the midrib, we're talking about large dark brown lesions. And so I think I'll just pass that one around. You can see everything you need to see with that leaf. That's Physoderma brown spot, and it does overwinter in the residue. It needs a lot of moisture though. So if you've had frequent rains in the spring, you may see a lot of this. All right, other things we've been seeing more of, uh, things like disease lesion mimic, like in these lower right-hand photos. This is actually a genetic issue, although the symptoms it causes look like disease lesions, hence the name. This is something that is silently carried in some hybrids, and it's only after certain environmental conditions trigger that response that we see the development of these ugly lesions. And they can look a lot like a disease because they'll often start at the bottom of a plant and move their way up. One year, this was the most common thing we saw in our plant and pest diagnostic clinic. So, okay, I'm, I'm finished with that one, thank you. Any questions about Goss's wilt or the other foliar diseases? Okay, I want to use our remaining time that I have with you to talk about foliar fungicide use because we have begun to use a lot more foliar fungicides. And in some parts of Nebraska, for instance, say in south central Nebraska, where we have arguably our highest quality soil, water, and our highest quantity of water, and we're producing our highest yields that we are across the state. We've used a lot of fungicides in that area, but that particular region of the state also has a history of southern rust, for instance. And in 2006, when southern rust was particularly a problem, more aggressive producers and crop consultants that did try fungicides had huge returns on them that got them on in time. Many of those same people have continued to use fungicides and they've become a normal part of the management practice in that part of the state. In spite of whether or not we have much gray leaf spot, which is our more common foliar disease. Well, obviously when we have more gray leaf spot, we get more consistent and larger returns in our yields from those, from those products. And so, for example, looking back in 2009 in one of our foliar fungicide trials, and we conducted this at the South Central Ag Lab near Clay Center, Nebraska, down there in the South Central area. I want you to keep in mind when you look at this, these are all overhead irrigated. They're all well, very well managed with adequate nitrogen and everything. With yields that were up over in excess of 250 bushels. In our non-treated control over here, we had 258 bushels, but some of our treatments yielded as much as 20 bushels higher. And so some of our highest yielding treatments in this case were some of our more common contemporary products like Headline Amp, Quilt Excel, and Stratego Yield. And so all of those products did a great job against gray leaf spot that year when it was so severe. We have also measured a lot of other plant characteristics in an effort to try to capture any of the plant health benefits that might be there. Those benefits have been very inconsistent for us and we've only occasionally thought we've captured them. For example, in 2010, similarly, we had low disease pressure, not much gray leaf spot at all. 
And in fact, our yields with some of those same products I just showed you, compared to the non-treated control, although some of them yielded eight or nine bushels more on average, they weren't consistent enough to give us a statistically significant reaction. In spite of that lack of significant yield in increase, one of the things we noticed that was improved in some of those treatments, actually all of those treatments, we reduced stock lodging by half in those trials in 2010. So in the non-treated control, we averaged 45% of those stocks lodged. And this is during a push lodging rating. So we have a technologist that walks the rows and pushes on all the plants, keeping track of which ones break over and don't snap back up. And we call that a lodged plant. Now, what we're probably measuring is most likely a stalk rot, but we can't say that because we're not actually splitting stalks. But every single one of these treatments during that year improved stalk lodging, cutting it in half. This isn't something we've necessarily seen every year, but it's something our producers are talking about in South Central Nebraska and why many of them are using fungicides year to year. Many of them understand they won't consistently get the yield increase, but getting that chance for improved standability is worth the investment for them because they say they can harvest much faster. And by harvesting at five or six miles per hour versus very slow at two to three trying to pick those stalks up, they believe they're saving a lot of money and not paying people driving the grain carts and the semis on the side of the field waiting. And so that's potentially one of the plant health benefits that we have been able to successfully show. Uh, similarly, we've also done a lot of work with V4 and V5 application of fungicides. And some of those are half rates that are then followed by full rates at tasseling. All of our products for the most part are applied at tasseling or shortly thereafter at R1. Well, in our V4 to V5 applications early in the season, we've also had a lot of inconsistency. And so only occasionally, such as in 2011, with a cool, wet spring, we've been able to show some benefits from those product uses. And so while we know there's probably times when they will do a good job, we haven't recommended them because we haven't been able to show consistent benefits with it. So. That's a synopsis of our foliar fungicide trials. You have a link on the blast page of this handout for Plant Disease Central, our website, which is where we do upload all of our fungicide trial results. Not only ours in our corn pathology lab, but my counterpart, Dr. Lauren Giesler, uploads his results from both his soybean cyst nematode nematicide trials as well as his fungicide trials on soybeans. So I welcome you to check out some of those and uh, let us know if you have questions about any of them. And now, thanks Bob. Any questions about all these diseases and fungicides that we've just talked about? And so the question is about, are wounds necessary for rust diseases? No, they make their own. And so gray leaf spot will come in through stomates and other things like that. Rust diseases actually create a penetration peg and a little germ tube that penetrates the surface of the leaf forcibly through there. And so no, they don't even need a wound. Some of the bacterial diseases need a vector or a wound to get in mainly. Uh, stalk rot pathogens and ear rot pathogens certainly do take advantage of wounding. And in fact, I want to mention the fact that we're in a serious drought right now really increases the risk for some problems this fall at and after harvest. Aflatoxin is one of those that I want you to be aware of. Aflatoxin is produced by the fungus aspergillus that causes an ear rot disease. Any of these ear rot problems will turn into grain mold problems in the bin. So if you can avoid, if you can avoid storing that grain, that'll actually be the best thing if you know you've got a problem. Low test weight corn like we're likely to have this fall is more prone to splitting and damage during harvest and handling too. And so they're going to be a higher likelihood for getting some of those grain molds and ear rots. Good questions. Well, you brought up aflatoxin. Is that going to mm -hmm. be a problem in feeding again then, like we had a couple years ago when we were so wet in the fall? It, it could be. Uh, aflatoxin is much more of a problem during very dry and hot years. It's very competitive during those conditions. 
during a wet year uh, in Nebraska a couple of years ago, we had more fumonisins and deoxynivalenol or DON or vomitoxin. Right. That one is very, very different. And so in that case, cattle are much more able to uh, withstand the effects of those toxins, much more so than swine. Uh, aflatoxin is different in that we monitor levels at much, much smaller concentrations in the parts per billion instead of parts per million. So there's a... But isn't, uh, like, gibberella will actually bring in aflatoxin, right? Uh, gibberella and fusarium are essentially the same fungus. Okay. And so one's a sexual and one's an asexual version of the exact same organism. They both can produce vomitoxin, fumonisins, deoxynivalenols, and... Uh, Trichothecine, trichothecines too. Is the That's the one. Toxin. Absolutely, Aspergillus flavus is the main one, and the sporulation you see is more of a an olive green color, and so that's the one you're looking for. Penicillium. It's just kind of blows up at you. Yeah, you can. Yeah, and you know, anywhere there's wounding on that ear, it's going to be prone to aspergillus and any other ear rot, whether it's insect injury, yeah. hail injury, or any other kind of I, silk cutting, and too. I was down by Menno um, from the rootworm beetles. Mm -hmm. I was pulling part of husk and it just kind of Ooh. blows up at you. That yeah, those are spores that are just flying, millions and millions of yeah. spores making that little cloud. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's bad. <laughs> 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 All right, any more questions? Well, you guys have been a great group. Our groups have just continued to get better every day and every hour. So I hope you continue to have a good day and appreciate your participation. We're here to help you. And people don't call us when things are going well. And so I'll wish for you that you don't have to call us, but we're glad to help in any case. You've got a lot of great experts at the universe, at Southern, South Dakota State University. And we all share expertise across state lines and are all happy to help each other. So we appreciate that help too. So. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Bob now and uh, let you talk about soybean diseases now. Okay, my name is Bob Fanning. Um, Connie Strunk put the handout together for you today and, and kind of outlined what she thought ought to get covered. Connie is a plant pathology field specialist based at the Sioux Falls Re Extension Center, Regional Extension Center. Uh, I'm the plant pathology field specialist based in the Winter Regional Extension Center. So just partly a lot to do with vir by virtue of location. Um, Connie is certainly pretty knowledgeable about soybean and, and probably corn diseases. My specialty probably tends to be a lot more on wheat because I've spent 24 plus years out in central South Dakota and, and seen way more wheat than have soybeans. So I didn't get too shook up about soybeans. Up until recently, uh, if soybeans had a problem, it's usually because it didn't rain in August. <laughs> or years ago, there was some iron chlorosis problems too. So people didn't usually mess too much with soybeans, but there's getting to be a lot more. And of course, being more regional now, uh, Tripp and Gregory counties in particular raise quite a lot of soybeans or not compared to here but compared to where I've been used to. Yeah, there's well for quite a few years anyway, 20 years or so or more. Yeah, so anyway, um, to start with, a great way to start a plant disease presentation or discussion, the disease triangle. I'm sure it's probably not new to anybody, um, but just really good to reemphasize that. In order to get plant disease, you need a susceptible plant, you need a pathogen, and you need the right environment. And it's not uncommon to have two out of those three, but it's when you get three out of those, three, all three of those, and, the, and you get a fair amount of overlap, that's when you get big problems and epidemics and we've we've dealt with some of those in various crops uh, to some extent uh, the producer and you guys as agronomists or crop consultants or whatever you can help educate producers we in extension try to do that as much as we can to try to do cultural things management things 
to influence this and to some extent we can or the producer can in some cases of course we kind of throw up our hands and, and we try to use fungicides in a lot of cases to intervene uh, with that and protect those crops but uh, I'm going to discuss a li little bit more detail some reasons why some very good reasons why if you can put together an overall plan and not just ignore things other than fungicides you're I think you're you've got a really good thing going uh, of course a hand lens was part of the handout material that you got and can be very useful in identifying some of these small structures and characteristics about different diseases I use them for insects and and parts of weeds or plants to identify different times so any agronomist ought to have hopefully the one you got yesterday just added to your collection um, one of the really key things that Connie I know intended to, to really emphasize at this session right here and I would certainly agree with that is to try to look at the kinds of characteristics that separate fungal diseases from bacterial diseases and viral diseases I think every single crop disease that we have falls into one of those three categories and if you can learn the characteristics if you don't already know them they can really help distinguish between some and and key in and narrow down what disease it is so they help identify it and that can be very important as Tamara already talked about so fungi or fungal diseases you mentioned earlier lesions or spots they're not the only disease that develops those but that's a very common characteristic and one thing that separates them for the most part from bacterial diseases is they tend to be fairly regular shape typically round oval lens shaped or in the case of uh, gray leaf spot possibly rectangular but typically fairly regular they also often will develop spores or structures in those lesions that give it some texture those are typically the fruiting bodies of the fungal disease where they produce spores and yeah cases like uh, Goss's wilt there can be other structures in there but they're actually not bacteria they're the fungal diseases that she mentioned that might actually survive on dead plant material that's already been killed by the bacteria uh, cottony mycelium is is common in some species of fu uh, fungal diseases some good examples would be really good example powdery mildew a downy mildew might be another one and white mold might be another one there are several or at least a couple of different signs of that but but those are some examples of a cottony mycelium that may be produced with fungal diseases usually no ooze or shiny slime that can be really helpful distinguishing between diseases we'll discuss more on that in the bacterial which is on the other side and the other next page bacterial diseases also tend to produce lesions but there tend to be a lot more angular and or irregular in shape and size they may they're often or may be bounded by leaf veins at least major ones and it might not be entirely or it may actually look like you might have lesions on both sides of a major vein but there's nothing saying that we didn't have two separate infections that happened to grow together and got bounded on either side of a vein too so it may look like one lesion there is with bacterial diseases very often or generally an ooze or shiny film well the reason for that is that bacterial diseases rupture cell membranes and when you rupture cell membranes the contents of those cells leak out and they're made up of fluids largely as well as different material in there which is why they get sticky so sticky surface on the leaf stem really not terribly unlike what happens when aphids feed on plants you get that honeydew as they suck out the sap but some of it leaks out that they don't get so that happens and then anytime you rupture cell membranes you're liable to get plants of wilt 
that's the structure what holds a plant upright and allows it to have that that upright structure is is the terger that's created when the cells take up moisture and hopefully are adequately hydrated with water but as plants you know they get short of water they wilt well the same thing happens with bacterial diseases similar kinds of things got some great pictures here on the next page of bacterial diseases versus fungal diseases on soybeans on the left hand side if you look closely there's a number of examples there where you can see where those bacterial lesions are bounded or limited by leaf veins and so you can look at that and, and see that and there may be a few other diseases scattered in there but the majority of those lesions on those leaves are, are bacterial and then on the right hand side we've got a fungal disease in this case I believe I understand it's downy mildew on soybeans and you can see where that's crossing right over a lot of leaf veins maybe somewhat limited but since it gets actually down in the tissue it'll just plow right through those in many cases on the bat next page we've got wheat bacterial versus fungal and on the left hand side you see there's no real regular consistency about shape or size on that to really to speak of it's just kind of random um, it, it does tend to be somewhat longitudinal parallel to the leaf vein direction again somewhat limited by leaf veins why did we last year you know last year was i thought it was kind of warm and there was so much bacterial on the wheat last year versus this year i'm not seeing the bacteria. i didn't see the bacterial but last year was horrid yeah i don't know i think in our area we probably didn't get the intense rainfalls events that, that we did in uh 2011 and i think that yeah, that yeah. has an awful lot to do with it because yeah. the splashing you know really really increases that some theory maybe but that that's pretty much got to happen for yeah. bacterial I mean, to like last year where i'm at the wheat yield was near not near as good as this year and the last year just yeah, the, we had more rain last year i mean it was definitely more intense rain showers last year this year was yeah. kind of pretty good for the small grain yeah but the bacteria was horrid last year wheat is kind of a funny crop yeah it actually to some extent likes dry weather yeah you just get a lot less disease yeah. with that regardless well fungal or bacterial diseases um 2011 was kind of a strange deal when I'm, I imagine most places I know out where I live and work most of the time we had a lot of aphids in the fall of 2010 and I was I mean in a sick kind of way <laughs> almost excited for the spring of 2011 because I knew there was going to be just <laughs> barley yellow dwarf coming out our ears and there was but it just really didn't have a big yield effect. What part of the yellow dwarf? Because it was cool and it was wet in June. It just really never stressed the crop. If it wouldn't have been like that, there are some fields that would have taken a big, big hit. I know there would have. But I, I actually visit a field with a producer uh i think he planted registered seed so he was you know he wanted to get it was planted on fallow that's why it was planted so early primary reason planted i think the 7th of september and he had aphids in it he did spray it but that's another whole story but he had aphids in it quite a few and they were in there for i'm gonna say two weeks or more before he sprayed it and didn't get them all but yet he I think if I remember correctly he said that field yielded like 70 bushels and weighed 62 pounds I think and he you know there were other fields that were planted later that didn't have near the barley oldorf that did not do as well does producers in your area spray for bird cherry in the fall that fall there was a few of them that did 
which is ironic because we're kind of getting away from soybean disease, but that's fine with me because I feel way more comfortable with wheat. Shouldn't say that, but um, actually, I don't think you'll find a university in the country that will recommend spring any aphids in the fall except green bugs. You look on Kansas State's website, they don't recommend doing that. They just don't feel it's justifiable. And I think probably in trying to present some management strategies after the, you know, prior to the planting season in the fall of 2011, I guess I threw out some ideas, particularly in these cases like in Lyman County, I know, in wheat planted in the fall of 2010, harvested in, in the summer of 2011, there were two cases where barley yellow was a real big issue and where, well, where aphids were present in the fall of 2010. That being, there are some guys that still fallow. And if you're gonna do that, you gotta plant at a reasonably early time or likely to, you might get it where it's gonna blow on you. And if it blows, it's pretty ugly sometimes. The other case was we had a fair amount of prevented plant ground that year. And so we had quite a few acres that went in pretty early. Now, my thought was if you have that situation, I think there's several things you can consider doing. One thing might be to use an insecticide seed treatment. You know, granted, you might get aphids if you plant somewhat early, but I think you could easily stand having a, a yellow leaf here and a yellow one over there and one over there you wouldn't even notice it for yield because yeah, the, you'll get a few plants infected with barley yellowdorf, but having that insecticide seed treatment there will kill the aphids and the, you'll never get these spots yeah. that will grow into you know fairly significant size. So that's one option. I think another option might be to go ahead and plant a cover crop and that's maybe pretty dependent on what you have for soil moisture in August but maybe grow yourself some residue and then plant later like the right. recrop no-till guys would do. I mean, yeah, continuous crop guys would do. You'd want to kill it well ahead of planting. Same as you would. Green bridge. Yeah, you want to break that green bridge or you're asking yeah. for it yeah. big time. But I think that may be an option if so moisture conditions allow that. Yeah. I think a third option might be considered. I've been watching, if you guys stayed for the pre weather presentation last night, um, we've got a lot of Kokoraz observers in Lyman County and a few of us that are very religious about reporting. And so it's, it's a pretty neat deal. You can go back to pick a time period you want, pick the stations you want, and get a report of three different stations at a time. You can get daily rainfall for whatever period of time you pick. So I picked, I think it was like the middle of August to 1st October, somewhere in there. It might have been the 1st of September to the, just September. But I just copied that data, put it in a spreadsheet, made a graph out of it, and boom, right on about the 9th of September, I think it was, we got two days of pretty significant rain event. I'm just thoroughly convinced that's when the aphids came in. So, knowing that, if you were to plant wheat, say the 10th of September, and you got a pretty good rain the 12th or whatever, you, if that's kind of ingrained in your head, you might say, I think I better go out there and look and see if I got any aphids. Now, you may have to do some hunting because they may not be multiplied and spread very far, but and I guess as inexpensive as some of the, a lot of the insecticides are, you might, you might just decide, I think I'm just gonna put it on anyway. I don't, I'm not really recommending that or advocating that, but particularly if you find aphids, if you went in there quickly, I think you might do yourself a lot of good. But I think this, it might've been the 7th of September. In fact, I think that's when it was, 7th or 8th, somewhere right in there. 
And this guy, a couple different guys that did a fair amount of spray in that fall, they didn't do it till like the 20th. That's so too long. Well, not only is the vector in there already, but a lot of those aphids move down into the crown and you just can't get them with insecticides. In fact, one guy sprayed, I, I checked a few different fields uh, a few days after they put the insecticide on and there was fewer aphids, but they were still there. Yeah. He didn't get them all because they got down too far in that plant. In what the crown. They, I know Hesha fly is not a big deal, but they can flare up. And what they cruise or help on the Hesha fly? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think it does. If you're in there pre, pre September 15th, you know, I mean, September 15th is a Hessian fly free date. Supposedly, yeah. Supposedly. I don't know if we have it well documented right. in South Dakota, but. but I mean, cruiser should. I think it them. can, yeah. yeah. I think it can help with a number of things. Right. Aphids, I think Hessian Richard, fly. Yeah. Um, I use cruiser. Super grasshoppers, I'd, I'd kind of more promote a double attack with grasshoppers. I mean, the seed treatment can help, but if you get one of these really, really heavy years, you better hit the borders with something yeah. foliar besides. Otherwise, you're, you're not, you may get overwhelmed. Yeah. There'd be too much feeding for it to come back. But appreciate the discussion on weed. I just feel way more comfortable with that. I know we don't, we don't want to ignore the soybeans either, but some of this is kind of general, as you can tell. But uh, next page, viral diseases tend to be much more random, a mosaic pattern often, um, hence the disease names like wheat streak mosaic virus, bean pod model virus, um, modeling, mosaic, very common terms used to name or describe those diseases. Uh, color streaks, often no lesions that you can pick out and say, oh, there's a lesion. Well, wait a minute, here's one that's kind of grown into it. I wonder if that's all one deal. It's, it's very much more random pattern. And organs like ears, heads, leaves, pods, I suppose, um, distorted, misshapen, whatever is not uncommon. Stunted development is very common and barley yellowdorf is kind of a classic example of that. Or wheat streak mosaic. Wheat streak too, but I, I really think about barley yellowdorf just because it occurs typically in, in patches as the aphids land and multiply and grow. And you can just look out over a field and here's healthy wheat, you know, standing up and then the, the weed in those patches is just, it could be six, eight inches shorter or, la or more. And it's just because the viral diseases tend to plug up the vascular tissues in plants. The xylem and phloem, the tubes and pipes that take up moisture nutrients. Well, you plug those up, you're inhibiting the growth and it just tends to stunt the plant. And obviously, consequently, you put that plant under stress. The temperature goes up, it gets dry. <coughs> it's, it's like a, a cigarette smoker trying to run a marathon. It just doesn't work very well at all. So they often can resemble herbicide injury, and I would qualify that to say maybe on plant symptoms. But you, if, once you look at the field pattern, you can probably say, oh, that's, that's not herbicide generally, quite often. Some good pictures on the next page here. Wheat streak mosaic on the left, uh, bean pod model virus on the right. Not so much the wheat streak, I don't think, but the bean pod model virus, I could see where somebody might look at that and say, oh boy, is that herbicide? You know, it might possibly be misunderstood for that. We shouldn't have to worry about it. Bean pod modifiers anymore. I haven't seen bean leaf forever. Yeah, well, you never know. It may be like some other things. They may be gone for a little while and then appear or something, but there's probably it's, so. It's just more so like the advancement of seed treatment. If you don't have first generations, that holds out from second generation quite a bit. They don't move tremendously far. So. Yeah. We've seen a decline in that. Too. Well, that might be a good thing, but it could crop up and you never know. That's not saying it's gone forever. So why is all that important? Well, oftentimes we tend to respond to diseases and it'd probably be better off if we kind of laid, put together an overall plan and tried to prevent disease, manage disease ahead of time. 
and it's not always possible, but a lot of cases it can be. And treatments, typically, when you think about that, we're, we're talking about fungicide, foliar fungicides, oftentimes are necessary and very beneficial. But we'd certainly advocate uh, integrated pest management and only use them when you need them. And you can feel like you're pretty confident you can get an economic return and there's a good reason and justified you can do that. And like I said, most economical and effective used with other methods of controlling those diseases. Um, and then kind of echoing the next page, plan to manage disease with host management, environmental management, pathogen management. You know, if you put together good crop rotations, choose good varieties or hybrids, and plan at the right time, you know, follow those good recommended management practices, you'll actually, I think, eliminate some of the need for a lot of pesticide use. And I kind of, every session, I guess, I've kind of gotten a little bit on a soapbox about this point. And like I said, I feel way more comfortable with wheat. I work a lot more with wheat than I do corn, soybeans. But it, it really amazes me uh, this spring how many producers I've talked to who planted wheat into soybean residue, field pea residue, oat residue, corn residue, milo residue, and then they'll put a foliar fungicide with the herbicide at tillery. Now, the problem I have with that is, what diseases are you protecting against with a tillery treatment? Septoria and, and tan spot. Tan Septoria spot. and tan spot. Now one guy did correct me, and I'd have to admit this, or he has a point to this, powdery mildew may yeah. be a possibility. Yeah, a lot of cloud cover and cool weather with that. And yeah. It, it may be something, but I don't think it's a major thing at that growth stage. Yeah. Typically, it's more when you get a bigger canopy. Right. And so, soybeans, field peas, oats, corn, milo, none of those diseases host tanspot or septoria. Oats can host a septoria, but it's a different organism. We've got some pictures in here after a little bit of septoria and soybeans but it's a different organism entirely and so you don't have the pathogen really present in the field in that scenario and so you remember that disease triangle yeah you'll probably get a little smattering of tan spot or septoria more likely later in the season but it's kind of like playing poker without looking at your hand. You know, you don't know what's going to happen, and uh, very little chance you're going to win. Even though, I know the reason it's done is because it's cheap, and I'm sure there's a little influence there. You know, if you go to the coffee shop and you're really smart because you do this practice, you know, you're really progressive, or you're getting these big wheat yields, or in some cases it might be, well, we got two agronomists that are kind of fighting over the same clients. And one is recommending this practice, and it's really cheap, you know, it doesn't cost much, but yet this other guy isn't. You know, I don't know for sure, but I'm wondering if there isn't some of that going on. And I guess we've got a little bit of a problem with it because there's been studies done, and I know I'm sure you've probably heard about this yield bump with some of the fungicides, right? Healthy plant phenomena, I guess they call it. Even in the absence of disease, sometimes you put a fungicide on, you get a yield bump. Well, uh, whoever really stressed that maybe ignored all the studies where there was either no response at all, or in some cases, actually a decrease. And that sometimes could be because of the fungicide, maybe added to the herbicide in the wrong chemistry. Or some of it's just plot variability. But, you know, there's not really strong evidence that you're going to consistently increase yield by enough 
certainly not enough to pay for it over the long term by doing that. The other problem I have with it is what about fungicide resistance? In North Dakota, they have, you know, raised this high dollar crop, chickpeas or garbanzo beans, and there's this terrible disease that'll literally pretty well wipe out a crop called Alaska Kita blight, and they cannot use quadrus anymore. And I think there might be one other fungicide they can't use, but one, one chemistry or mode of action they can't use anymore because it's resistant to it. Could that happen with wheat? I don't know. Does that kind of practice promote that? I think that's exactly what promotes that. Widespread use of particularly low rates of a pesticide. That's so cheap. Yeah, that's right. That's why it's done. But the headset application, I mean, you don't know if you're going to get fusarium. I mean, that's... Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been robbed so many times by fusarium. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, so I've said... I've said a number of times, I think you probably get the biggest bang for your buck out of the flag leaf treatment. I think I'd back up and revise that. I may, I may say the flower treatment may That's be even I, bigger. I skip the, I do, I do the half ray, I'm guilty of that. Well, if it's planted back on wheat residue. And then I come back. I nothing wrong with that at all. Just because I, I mean, you might miss some striped rust like this year if we did miss some of that. But I gotta say, it didn't become. It, it got hot and it kind of just kind of dissipated. Some of that striped rust did. Yeah. But I've just been killed by, you know, with vomitoxin and everything as far as scab, and so I just can't skip that. Well, I, Connie and I both went to this fields or uh, crop and pest management scouting school in North, in Fargo. Yep. In March, and I made a point of visiting with Marsha McMullen, who yeah. I think may be retired by now, but she was a plant pathologist in North Dakota, and I asked her about the, this deal, and their timing is a little different than ours, because, you know, people say you go about 17 miles north, and that's about a day in maturity for wheat. Well, she said they, they are getting to kind of the point where they really don't even hardly advocate a flag leaf treatment anymore. And I'm not where I'm at, but I'm in northern South Dakota. Yeah. And I, I think it may depend on where you're at as to what strategy you use. But I can, I can also say, the question come up last session, and I might as well just say it doesn't take long. You know, there's four different times you might use a fungicide on, on wheat. Seed treatment, tillering, flag leaf, and flowering. Well... Seed treatment, I think, should be a no-brainer, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, assuming we have, we'll have time. I think that's a no-brainer. You just ought to do it. Tillering, I would advocate it if you're planting into wheat stubble, and I may skip it if it looks like the weatherman may be forecasting dry weather. Because I've looked, I have looked at a lot of SDSU research trials that have no response whatsoever, but the rainfall was also not there. So that's a questionable one, the, probably the most questionable one to me. Right. The flag leaf one, I think the decisions that would notch you over and say, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put that on, pull the trigger and, and do it. One, yield potential. And you know, the kind of the magic trigger we've used for a long time, maybe ought to get bumped well, maybe you should get bumped down. 45 bushels has kind of been the hypothetical number. Somebody hit it when they threw a dart. Somewhere in that neighborhood, I guess is what I'd say. A crop consultant told me at Dakota Lakes this summer, he said, boy, if I don't get, my clients don't get 65 bushels, I'm going to get fired. Well, what if the potential's only got there and it's not your fault? You know, I don't, what if for whatever reason, if you don't have good yield potential, that's that much less reason to put a fungicide on. Because if you save 5% or 10% yield loss, it's a lot less number. But there's other factors that, that play into that. So yield potential is one. I think resistance of the variety to that disease is another big factor. You know, if you're kind of on the, on the borderline and on the edge as to whether you ought to do it or not, you know, that resistance might tip you one way or the other. 
um, presence of disease and lower canopy, flag mice one, flag mice two, you know, if you're, if you're just not seeing it, why not skip the flag leaf treatment and wait and see what happens flowering time? If it's there, and particularly, well, the next factor is weather conditions forecast. You know, every one of those that are going to promote disease are one more notch to say, you know, it's a no-brainer, put the fungicide on. If you're not seeing those, you may be able to save yourself some money and not see any difference. Okay, we're at weather conditions. Um, next, another one is um, market price of wheat. <laughs> Obviously, the more it's worth, the less in yield increase it takes to pay for it. And another one is the cost of fungicide treatment. And it's not getting cheap to fly airplanes anymore from what I hear. If you use your own ground rig or a ground rig, you're running over wheat. So that's costing you something besides what it costs to run up and down the field. And then I, I guess some fungicides are a little more expensive than others, but they're not, a lot of them aren't terribly expensive, but getting it on there is costing you something. So consider it. I think that same idea applies to whether you're going to put a fungicide on corn or on soybeans too. I mean, there's different yields and factors to consider, but the same principles apply. Jeff was telling he makes great margins, so he's just going to recommend it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was with one crop oil. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I know after 2007, especially when that, when that leaf rust hit and people, a lot of jiggling was planted, you know, I think a lot of people went from, boy, I don't think I want to put on a fungicide and, you know, incur all that expense. And they just totally flopped over and, and now it's routine. And I, I really don't think it ought to be routine. Um, kind of got off the track there a little bit, but got a picture of bacterial blight on soybeans there. And we got some plant mounts up here too. I'll hand around, you can look at kind of quick, but any bacterial disease and, and that one, I guess in particular, uh, promoted by heavy winds and rain, again, injury to the plant tissue that's going to allow an entry point for that bacteria to get in there. Long cool periods is going to promote that. Uh, on the next side, as you see, soybeans are susceptible to a septorial disease, leaf uh, septorial fungal disease, but it's again not even close, not the same organism as that what affects wheat. That's called brown spot. Um, Next, we've got a phytophthora root and stem rot in soybeans. Any kinds of conditions that lead to or cause slow emergence, that much more time for that plant to get out of the ground. Um, wet fields, I think probably cool temperatures, um, generally lead to higher severity of that. Isn't soil, uh, seed treatment, a big factor in that? Phytophthora? Yeah, no. I it thought. Suppresses it only. Okay, well, not a true I should say not a big factor, but it's a way of helping to manage it, yeah. but not, not a real, something to really count on. If I remember right, I'll comment on something else related to that here in a bit. Kind of a grainy, fuzzy picture of Phytophthora. Good time to mention, if you haven't seen Phytophthora and want to see it, Connie Tandy, the manager of the Plant Diagnostic Lab, made a point of finding and, and potting a few soybean plants that are infected with Phytophthora and as well as some healthy ones to compare them to, which you don't always see the Phytophthora infected plants that are still alive. So here we have some. So if you want to take a look at those, do that. New, uh, I mean, they've always used RPS1K in the past as far as the natural gene against Phytophthora, which now race 25 is becoming so dominant for Phytophthora in this state, so now the RPS3A will cover race three and race four and also race 25, and that's probably the best way of managing it now. The, the varieties. The RPS3A gene that's being introduced in soybean varieties now. Variety resistance. By far the best. That's yeah. good news, but if you can avoid, if you have some control over conditions as to holding off planting or planting so that you avoid that slow emergence wet field issue that I mentioned there, 
that may help too i don't know that isn't always going to work but sounds like varieties are the best way yeah, to go i mean a couple years ago we really didn't have that now, yeah. now a lot of companies seed companies are introducing rps3a because race 25 is becoming our big one here yeah and that has resistance on race 25. that sounds like a no-brainer it is next page shows some uh, characteristics and identifying features of Hytoptera. My theory is you guys I think can all probably read is about as well as I can if not better. So that kind of lets you do that. Picture a stem canker on the next page there and again some identifying characteristics and I think you can kind of read that. Then we also want to mention this issue I'm sure you've heard of it but sudden death syndrome in soybeans to my knowledge i don't believe it's ever been identified here in south dakota yet we're not saying you know oh my god you you know that would be your priority but we're saying that it's something to be aware of and to kind of look for and the reason one of the biggest reasons is look at the map of south dakota and the counties where it's been identified positive confirmation of those um, a number of south, southern Minnesota counties which are just across the border from this area and so the kind of things to look for if you see some problems in wet fields and you see uneven growth and particularly in areas where there's a known history of soybean cyst nematode and then you see the symptoms that are in the next few pictures boy I'd I know that the plant diagnostic lab at SDSU would really, really like to hear from you and get a sample. It's a fusarium type pathogen, so yeah, the nematode fields are, the guy's seen a whole of it in Minnesota. Yeah. And it's obviously the fields that are heavily infested with nematode were just, that's where, I mean, it, we didn't see a lot of it last year like we did before, but planting date has a lot to do with managing this too. Because it likes that colder environment early on, so the late flying day can help too. Well, that's good to know. Um, some really good leaf pictures there, typical leaf symptoms. You see there of a field that's infected with uh, sudden death syndrome. Um, on the next page, there's some more leaf symptoms, plus, a characteristic that apparently is at least pretty unique if not unique to sudden death syndrome if you see some suspect plants or a field dig up some roots and see if you have this bluish fungal growth on the roots and I like I said if you see that I, I know the plant diagnostic lab would be very like much like to hear from you the next page there uh, there is some variety difference for sudden death syndrome and I don't know where this plot is, but uh, you can see there's a couple of susceptible varieties, a couple rows of susceptible varieties planted in between ones with more resistance. And it's uh, not really a typical root rot. Uh, I didn't know about the fusarium part, but I, I'm not, I don't doubt that. And apparently there's some toxins from the fungus that, that kind of speed up the nail in the coffin deal and and cause it to go downhill so apparently it happens pretty quick there are some mimics or you know similar looking diseases to sudden death syndrome one of those is brown stem rot you can see here the leaf symptoms are not very unlike sudden death syndrome but the split the stem and you see that brown pith inside there that's totally different and I, a few pages back here there's a comparison on the same picture of those two um, another one might be fusarium wilt um, i don't know if the they don't show leaf symptoms but you can see it's not looking real prime but if you cut the stem at kind of a angle you can see the discolored vascular tissues in there and that's different than sudden death syndrome um, Get my pages stem rise that it has to overwinter on a host, falls off the host, it perishes. Where with sudden death, it does not have to have a host to overwinter. That's why it can live so long. So rotation with, with so lives in the soil. 
Yeah, brown stem rod can be managed with rotation easy. Yeah. I think we're going to rely pretty heavily on resistant varieties for the yeah, sudden so death syndrome. Here's another picture of brown stem rot that doesn't look totally different than those two rows of sudden death syndrome. So on a field standpoint, it might not look a whole lot different, but again, the inside of the stems of brown stem rot are very, very distinctive. And I believe it's the next picture, yeah, shows the top picture is uh, sudden death syndrome and the bottom one is brown stem rot in a very, very distinctive difference. So it would be very easy to dis deter discriminate between those two. Another difference is uh, if you look at the sudden death, your leaves will fall off and your petioles will stay. Or brown stem rot, the leaves stay on. Okay. Kind of like by top that could be very useful you can see too. That in the picture too. Yeah. Uh, second last page here SDSU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Um, they diagnose an awful lot of issues, insects, diseases, weeds, all kinds of environmental factors, all kinds of things at their address, phone number and email address on there and, and you can drop off plants if it happens to be after hours, I understand. Um, and also Connie, Tan Connie Strunk's contact information is on the very back of the handout too.